Thy kingdom come. In American culture, we don't understand very much about kings and kingdoms. Our country was born out of revolution against a king. And actually, in the world today, many nations have moved away from monarchies where royalty has absolute power, absolute authority, and can do anything without fear of recrimination. If we hear about a leader like that, we refer to him as a dictator and we're outraged at his acts. No one should have that kind of power, we believe. So we don't understand much about kings and kingdoms. But yet, we need to understand the kingdom of heaven because that was so central to Jesus' message. He mentions it over and over again in the Gospels. He refers to it both as the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and those two terms are synonymous. But unfortunately, Jesus didn't give us a nice little definition of the kingdom. He told stories, he would drop little hints, and he spoke in metaphors and similes to help us get a glimpse of the kingdom. So he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, a treasure, a merchant looking for pearls. And in our scripture reading for today, we heard that he said, we are to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to try to understand a little bit about the kingdom today. The kingdom of God is where God is sovereign. He has complete wisdom and authority. His will alone is accomplished. And kingdom reality is really twofold. It is a paradox, in fact. Kingdom reality is both a present, something we experience now, and it is something yet to come. It is something that we will experience in its fullness when Jesus returns. And often, scholars express this by calling it the already and the not yet. And we see that in scripture. Scripture verses that refer to the current kingdom reality and also to the reality that is to come. So for example, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' ministry begins with these words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Matthew chapter three, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom was inaugurated with Christ coming to earth, and it continues to spread in and through the lives of the people who follow Jesus. Jesus has come, and God has established a beachhead. We also see in scripture how the kingdom is not yet. For example, Romans 8, 22, the whole creation is groaning in the pains of childbirth. We ourselves groan as we await the redemption of our bodies. Someday Christ will return and establish the kingdom in its fullness. So we live in this tension of the already and the not yet. In the meantime, before Christ returns, during this time of not yet, we have a threefold task. We pray, we live as kingdom people, and we partner with God in the work of the kingdom. So first of all, we pray, and we pray as Jesus taught us, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Or as Pastor John Ortberg said, may up there come down here. Lord, may your kingdom come in the midst of our pain and struggle in our lives. May it come in the midst of the struggles in our nation and in our world. Lord, may your kingdom come in the midst of Russia invading the Ukraine, in the midst of Christians martyred in Syria and Nigeria, in the midst of violence and injustice. Lord, thy kingdom come. Make things right. May up there come down here. We pray for the kingdom of God to come. 
And then we also live as kingdom people. Because the kingdom is manifest and embodied in God's people. Luke 17, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom was coming, and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. It is among you. That phrase in the Greek indicates more the sense of within you and around you. So wherever Jesus is, there is the kingdom, including in our own hearts and lives. As Christ lives within us, we are kingdom people. And we're called to live under God's rule and reign. And because of that, discipleship is necessary. We have to learn how to be kingdom people. This is a kingdom with different values. The values and rules of the kingdom are God's. And they are values such as compassion and justice, love and mercy. People should be able to tell that we are Christians by how we live our lives. John Hess Yoder served as a missionary in Laos. And he said that before there were national boundaries, the kings of Laos and Vietnam reached an agreement. Those who ate short grain rice, who built their houses on stilts, and decorated them with Indian-style serpents, were considered Laotians. On the other hand, those who ate long grain rice, who built their houses on the ground, and decorated them with Chinese-style dragons were Vietnamese. The exact location of a person's home was not what determined his or her nationality. Instead, each person who belonged to a particular kingdom was identified by those outward signs. The cultural values of the person were apparent by how they lived. And so John Hess Yoder said, so it is with us. We live in the world, but as a part of God's kingdom, we are to live according to kingdom values, kingdom standards. We're born into the kingdom when we come to faith in Christ. But in a sense, we're not born to it because we don't naturally exhibit kingdom values. It's a matter of learning how to be a kingdom person, learning how to be Jesus' follower. So that's why being intentional about our growth as disciples is important. Learning how to read and study scripture, learning how to pray, and allowing the Holy Spirit to develop a Christ-like character within us. And we also need to help others grow in their walk with Christ. <coughs> Discipleship really is learning to be a kingdom person. We pray, we live as kingdom people, and we partner with God in the work of the kingdom. Now one thing that's important to realize is that Christians sometimes speak of the kingdom as something that we bring about by our own efforts. And so you might see a church that says, our vision is to usher in the kingdom of God. But that misses the biblical point, because God brings about his rule and reign. God is the one who establishes the kingdom. And we partner with God in the work of the kingdom. So for example, we're called to be good stewards of our finances and resources. We use our money to partner with God in the work of the kingdom. We are also called to serve, and we have been given spiritual gifts appropriate to our call. So I encourage you, as you have gifts and call, to become a small group leader, to mentor someone who wants to grow in their faith, to listen to a teenager's struggles, to help a child learn about Jesus. 
As I said earlier, in a little while you will hear a testimony from Ray, who was on the mission team, and that mission team used their gifts to help provide basic necessities to people in our city. All of us have spiritual gifts. Wisdom, leadership, mercy, service, teaching, faith, whatever your gift, use it. Use it. Invest it. Use your gifts to partner with God in the work of ministry. God extends this invitation to come and be a part of what he is doing and make a difference in the world. No one could argue that computers have revolutionized the world, but that is only a recent thing. It was just three generations ago that IBM chairperson declared there is a world market for about five computers. Well, the revolution was brought to us in large part by Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers. Steve Jobs was just 21 years old when he and Steve Wozniak invented the first Apple computer. And until then, computers were vacuum tubes filling rooms. The two Steves managed to take that mass of tubes and incorporate them into a box small enough to sit on a desk. So Jobs and Wozniak offered their invention to Atari and Hewlett Packard. They weren't looking to make a lot of money, they just wanted a salary and the ability to continue their work. But these two companies said no. So Jobs sold his car and Wozniak sold his calculator and with $1,300 they formed Apple Computers. The company was named Apple in memory of a summer that Jobs had spent working on an orchard. And as we all know, the rest is history. Now Steve Jobs was a visionary, and he soon realized that the company needed more management expertise. And so he approached John Scully, the president of PepsiCo, and asked him to come and be a part of Apple Computer. Now think about that. There was absolutely no reason why Scully should leave a highly paid position in a leading company to go work with a bunch of computer nerds in a brand new industry. So it's no surprise that he turned Jobs down. But Jobs wouldn't take no for an answer. He approached Scully again. And again, Scully turned him down. Finally, in a last ditch effort, Jobs asked Scully a question that forced him to accept. And the question was this, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want a chance to change the world? And they went on, of course, to change the world. Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water? Or do you want a chance to change the world? That's the question that is posed to us. Do we want to be a part of what God is doing? Most of us spend our lives in our own concerns, going to work, accumulating possessions, saving up for retirement. And we find time for God only in our spare time. But Jesus had a vision and a mission to change the world. And he calls us to place the kingdom of God at the center of our lives. To make it the reason for our existence. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May up there come down here. And may it begin in each of our lives. Amen. <laughs>